Aloha, as we take a little time to let everybody join this live webinar and on the MISC Facebook Live. Just want to welcome everybody to another Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month um, talk as we explore invasive species of Valkanaka, that area that we all live, work, and play in here in Hawaii. And as we're taking a little time for people to join, there is a poll for those people joining us in the Zoom webinar. Um, it helps us with a little bit of demographics and planning for the next year. So thank you very much for participating in that poll. We'll leave it up for about a minute. And now I will pass it off. Hi, I'm Beth with the Hawaii Invasive Species Council, and I'm going to pass it off to Serena with the Maui Invasive Species Committee. All right, aloha mai kako, aloha po alima, happy aloha Friday, everybody. We made it, it's Friday. Um, I'm Serena Fukushima, I'm the Public Relation and Education Specialist with the Maui Invasive Species Committee. Um, and I'm here to help introduce Adam Knox, who's our Operations Manager. Uh, before we get going though, just some housekeeping. We are in a, um, a Zoom webinar, which means we won't be able to hear you or see your faces. So please engage though, please um, put your questions or comments in the chat or the Q&A box. Uh, we're also live on the Maui Invasive Species Committee Facebook page. So if you're joining us over there, please put any questions or comments in that comment section. And at the end of the presentation, we will ask them and Adam will answer them for you. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Adam Knox. He's the operations manager at the Maui Invasive Species Committee. He was formerly the Brown Tree Snake Rapid Response Team Coordinator at USGS on Guam and has been working on invasive species projects since 2008 when he got his start on MISC's plant control team. Adam enjoys surfing, sailing, and playing with his three-year-old daughter, who is the cutest thing um, in his free time. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Adam to talk about new detections and rapid response that MISC has addressed in 2021. Take it away, Adam. Thanks, Serena. Hopefully everybody can hear me all right. Um, yeah. yeah, so that was a great introduction. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I am the operations manager at MISC, and uh, I've been um, working on invasive species since 2008. Um, I've been involved in rapid response uh, in the Hawaiian Islands, Guam, Palau, Saipan, Rota, um, done training throughout the region, um, Micronesia in particular um, for snakes, snake response, but um, there's a lot of overlap with um, all sorts of different invasive species that uh, we're concerned about coming in that we need to respond to. Um, so I want to talk about three new invasive species reported and confirmed on Maui um, in particular that we've um, initiated rapid responses to in 2021. And the first is the Cetacula crameri, um, which is the rose ring parakeet, um, pretty green birds, top right. Um, the second is the Pycnonotus kafer, which is the red vented bulbul, which is a newer, introdu newer introduction, um, came in around the end of this, uh, of 2021. Um, and then the uh, third is a plant, it's a tree aster called Vernon Anthura polyanthes, and it's commonly known as uh, Asa Peche, and that uh, means fish roast in four degrees. And so I'll talk a little bit about that here in a bit. Um, but before we start, it's important to understand how biological invasions typically play out and how we can influence the direction um, of those based on how quickly we act. Um, and as you may already be able to tell um, by looking at this curve, being on the left side of that is the best. Um, the further the right we go, the more time and space uh, an invasive species has to take hold, which ultimately translates into increasing costs of control. And the worst case is that a species can become so widespread that eradication is no longer economically feasible or even physically possible, which in turn might require uh, like a long-term management um, effort to take place in perpetuity um, to protect resources related to the environment, um, the economy, or um, even public health. So here's a non-exhaustive non list of uh, some considerations that go into rapid response. Um, and the first two fit nicely with uh, Mr. Jeff Goldblum getting chased by a tyrannosaur and that you need to act fast to have a shot at containing the species um, before it spreads any further. Um, or in this case, before you get eaten. 
Um, it's also important that you get the information while it's still fresh and unevolved. Um, none of the, you know, uncle's big fish stories um, <laughs> as the stories of all over time, right? Um, and the second point, it's really important that we, uh, so we don't launch the proverbial thousand ships on a wild goose chase over nothing. Um, and, you know, an example of this is uh, of trying to vet reports that come in is with snakes, you'd be surprised what gets mistaken for a live snake sometimes. Um, things like ropes, toy snakes, and uh, I think we've even had burnt PVC pipes be mistaken for live snakes and reported as such. Um, so for snakes in particular, um, we do go through a, a pretty exhaustive interview process. Um, we do this with the other species as well, but um, to try, we want to try to narrow down what was seen and then rule out any other possibilities. Um, but of course, having photos, um, photos are worth a thousand words. Um, and are often the best and most helpful points of evidence during rapid response and early detection. Um, and then obviously determining scope and scale um, helps us figure out where we're at on that curve, uh, that invasion curve when we get started with the response effort. And um, you, you could probably tell if you're reading through these that all these factors are interrelated and they do affect the ultimate goals and planning during a rapid response. Um, and you see my little cartoon at the bottom right there, it's just an important to note here that they, almost all rapid responses are, are multi-agency affairs um, that best leverage the unique skills and talents um, across a you know, wide uh, range um, that is always typically needed when new invaders arrive since um, you know, we can't be experts in everything, right? And in this whole process with rapid response and early detection, like I cannot stress enough the value and necessity of public participation and vigilance here. Um, the faster the public is educated on what to look out for and how to report what they see, the faster we can understand the size and the scope of the problem and potentially eradicate a newly introduced invasive species or uh, an already introduced species that has spread to a new location. Um, and so while we have expertise in responding to invasive species, um, obviously we, we are unfortunately not omnipresent to detect them. And um, nearly all of our new detections have come by way of public reports. Um, so you can see on the curve, the, the closer we can get that public awareness down to that uh, on the left side, the better. So getting into our first uh, rapid response um, species here that we've uh, been working on, um, the rose ring parakeet. Um, these birds are native to the Indian subcontinent and equatorial Africa, but they can be found throughout the world uh, in the pet trade, as well as uh, areas where they have been introduced. Um, this is considered one of the world's worst invasive uh, birds. Um, they're a brilliant green color. They got a red beak and the males have uh, the namesake rose ring around their necks once they reach maturity. And that happens at about a year and a half. Um, um, these birds are a significant threat to agriculture in Hawaii uh, due to their ability to transport seeds of invasive plants. Um, they eat fruits and, um, and commercial crops. Um, they could definitely negatively affect the, the health of the Hawaiian watersheds, um, for sure, in addition to causing problems with the economy and, and agriculture. Um, it's also worth noting that these birds can carry um, and transmit zoonotic diseases um, directly and through their poop. And, um, on Kauai, some vacation condo properties have installed automatic car washing stations because the bird droppings uh, are so bad. So you can see here how these birds kind of came into Hawaii. Um, so they have actually a fairly long history here. Um, on Oahu, they were introduced in the 1930s. Um, currently they're present in fairly large numbers, mostly in town in the, um, metropolitan areas of Honolulu. And it's estimated there's close to 5,000 birds probably there at this point. Um, Maui, we did not think that there was any of these birds here until this last year, and now we know them to be present. Um, and luckily they're in somewhat limited numbers based on our surveys at this point. And so we believe there's probably in the range of 18, eight to 15 birds. Um, we don't know for sure though. Um, Kauai has the, the mother load where they had two birds introduced in 1965. And I believe these were in like a bed and breakfast type area. They were pets kept in a cage and they were released. And now there's uh, potentially up to 20,000 birds on that island. Um, so as you can see in that top right photo, it's 
quite devastating to agriculture there. Um, their farmers are starting to go to great lengths, both large scale and small to protect their fruit crops and, um, and uh, keep it under control. Um, we don't really know how the birds got to Maui. Um, they may be wild descendants of released pets like the birds on Kauai, or maybe they managed to fly here from one of the other Hawaiian islands. We're not sure. And, um, but Dr. Jane Anderson, who's at the Texas A&M University in Kingsville, she's helping us try to solve this riddle by comparing the genetics of the birds that we've captured here on Maui with the birds of, that are found on the other islands. So what do these birds sound like? It's important to know what they sound like. Hopefully everybody can hear that, kind of this trill chirp. And you can hear that, you know, well above, uh, well high above in the air uh, when they're flying around. They're, they're definitely very vocal. Um, that play for just a second. Definitely seemingly louder than most of the other birds that would be around in the area. So we always want to try to make sure that folks, um, you know, people know what the birds look like, obviously, or the species looks like, and in the case of these birds, um, what they sound like. But it's really important that we also educate the public enough so they can tell the difference between other species that may look um, similar. Um, so here, uh, Serena put together a great comparison between um, the rose ring parakeet and the rosy faced lovebird. And so we received a lot of reports um, once this rapid response started um, going and we had a lot of uh, you know, input from the community. We, saw, we received a lot of reports about uh, uh, lovebirds that you know, they, people thought they were rosary parakeets. And so you know, things like this are really helpful um, for people to be able to look at and understand the differences. So we're pretty lucky uh, with this bird in particular, um, just in that it's a pest in other parts of the world where it's been introduced and there's been quite a bit of research done to better understand the biology of the bird as well as their impacts, um, which is helpful to us during a rapid response early detection scenario um, and just trying to you know, piggyback of what people have already done. Um, we've got our partners on Kauai, their experience to draw from um, who they've already tried different methods, um, or done different research projects on this to try to reduce the population numbers there. Things like sterilization techniques, trapping, um, other methods, including lethal control, uh, have all been tested and are um, and or are operational over there. And currently, the most humane and economical way to control these birds in the wild is by wing shooting them with a shotgun or with a high-powered air rifle at night if a roost can be identified. Um, and so like here on Maui, we don't know where the roosts are. On Kauai, they, there's so many that they know where the roosts are. And so that's one of our big challenges is trying to understand where these birds are at. Um, so where have we found these birds? Where are these birds? Um, well, this all started in Kihei um, where we captured our first bird in July, early July. And um, we received a report from 643pest.org um, had great photos. It was very, you know, very clear, um, a great, great report. So we zipped over there and um, I actually took this photo right before we were able to hand capture the bird. Um, this bird, I believe it was a wild bird. Um, it's, you know, hard to tell when these bird, this bird was clearly habituated to condo guests feeding it. So you can see it's munching on a risk crack, rich cracker in that photo. Um, so it was somewhat approachable, but it wasn't, you know, didn't seem like a pet, but uh, it's always hard to tell. So we were able to capture this bird. The second one um, was a bird that was found in Kahului by a member of the public uh, in September, the end of September. This bird was pretty tame. Um, so it's very possible that it could have been an escaped pet. Um, you know, and, and an important point too is keep in mind that these birds are illegal to keep as pets in Hawaii. Um, but um, I'm sure you can imagine there, there are smuggling, illegal smuggling that uh, of pets that that uh, has occurred here in Hawaii. Um, so again, hard to tell. The third bird, um, and this is obviously a male bird, you can see the rose ring collar around its neck. Um, this was found just after the new year in Spreckelsville, and that's, um, it's at Baby Beach. So this is an area just kind of northeast of the Kahului Airport. Um, this bird, again, also seemed oddly tame. Um, Maybe it was an escape pet, but it's hard to know for sure. 
And, uh, you know, like what I mentioned with Dr. Anderson, she's trying to help us suss out whether these birds have a genetic line that's very different from the birds that are on the other islands, um, meaning that they are, you know, have their own Maui line or they're, you know, even different from any sort of Maui line, wild line that could be here um, that might help us determine if these are escaped pets or they actually do come from, um, you know, the other islands. So while we've had some luck in reducing the population size um, with, with a relatively high percentage because we believe that there's not very many of these birds on island, there still are wild birds that we've detected um, based on reports we've see, received from the public that are out on the west side of the island. And this is in the Kapalua, Napili area of Maui. Um, my last count uh, in the area was eight birds. Um, and while we've been able to improve our detection of the population based on areas we've come to know that they frequent, we still don't know exactly where they call home, like the roost sites. And that's a really important piece of the puzzle that we're working on. Um, but one of the advantages that we've had here during this rapid response is starting to over time understand the habits and the um, and predictability with where these birds, we might see these birds based on the, the trees and the areas that they're visiting. And it's really important to mention what I said about the public, um, the media has been very helpful to us in this regard. We've, we've never been able, we would have never been able to expand our understanding of where these birds are at on Maui without the help of um, the reporting that went out um, uh, to the public. There was, you know, a subsequent just in, influx of, uh, of reporting after these went out saying, oh, I saw those, you know, I saw, I've seen something in my neighborhood. I think it's just like that. Um, so it's very helpful. Um, and we still get reports based on, um, you know, these, uh, these news stories that went out, you know, people, oh, I remember that news story. So very helpful coverage. And so here's kind of the timeline of how the rapid response has sort of gone. And I won't go through all of them, but I, the, the most important thing is to mention, I think, is that we've discovered that pattern and I have that underlined because um, pattern um, indicates possible predictability. And so that helps for us to establish a routine um, based on any routine we can see with these birds. Um, we have tried trapping with mist nets. And so you can see that picture has the, uh, I put the purple box around it because the mist net is actually pretty hard to see. Um, and that's on purpose. Um, we haven't had any luck with that, unfortunately. Um, but um, yeah, we, we continue to, to do the best we can um, by, Again, trying to make use of the predictability of these birds. And a lot of that is, has been dictated on public reports. So we can start to triangulate or narrow down where the birds um, are gonna be at any given time of the day or um, areas that like to go. And luckily we've established a really great um, network and um, relationship, um, I guess, relationship network with the landowners that these birds um, are visiting. Um, so we're getting texts and things like that. You know, I saw the bird last night or I've been seeing the birds lately. So, so we're getting good feedback in that regard. Um, we did try using that first bird I captured as a lure bird, um, which was pretty neat, um, you know, having it call in. Um, unfortunately, we didn't yield any, any other birds at that point. So what do we do next here? Um, well, we're gonna continue to do the surveys and control attempts. Um, and um, like I said, identifying roost sites, if possible, was really important. So we want to try to get there if we can, um, figure out where these birds are roosting. We want to refine the understanding of uh, the bird patterns if we can. Like I said, we already have a great, uh, a better understanding of where these birds might go, but any refinement of that would be helpful. Um, and then I think just exploring other passive um, things like traps or um, other methodology. And like I said, luckily we've, we've had good, um, information come from other parts of the world where they've had to deal with this, Canary Islands, for, for example. Um, so yeah, we'll keep working on this. And, and you know, like I said, we think there's less than 15 birds on the island. So we have a shot at uh, eradication here. Um, so we'll see what happens. Don't ever, don't, I usually don't like to say the E word, um, but I think we do have a good shot. So next on our list is the red vented bull bull. Pike Nodus Kafer. Um, like I said, this bird came in towards the end of 2021. Um, it's native to Asia and introduced illegally through the pet trade in the 1950s on Oahu. Um, the most distinctive 
identifier of this bird is its black cardinal-like crest on its head. Um, and this bird is also a major agricultural and garden pest. Um, I know the commercial orchid industry on Oahu is impacted somewhere to the tune of $300,000 each year um, from these birds alone. So um, they can be pretty bad. Um, they're quite aggressive towards other birds. So there's definitely fear that they could compete with or displace native birds. Um, and they also, of course, they love to eat seeds of invasive plants that we, we control uh, like Myconia, which has been uh, documented in uh, New Caledonia and other parts of the world. So uh, definitely could be a watershed modifying bird. So here's what they sound like. Hopefully everybody can hear that. Yep, loud and clear. Um, so these birds are already present in large numbers island wide on Oahu. Um, they were not known to be present on Maui until uh, recently, uh, but it's been an early detection species for quite some time. We were lucky in that um, uh, one of the bird experts who's up at Haleakala National Park noticed this bird and confirmed it um, uh, in November of 2021. And so we were able to at least have it on our radar. And just like with the rose ring parakeet, part of our job is to try to educate the public about what these birds look like, um, what other birds may be mistaken for red vented bulbuls. Um, the most common case of mistaken identity is with the red crest and, and northern cardinals, um, which also have you know, crests on their head. You can see that upper right photo and then the, the one in the middle, the bottom middle. Um, the bulbul is the only one with a jet black crest. And so that's you know a cardinal with a jet black crest basically is what you're looking for. And it's got, got that, um, the, the red vent obviously, it's quite, quite bright. So while the distribution of these birds on Maui is currently not as clear as it is with the rosering parakeet, um, you know, we, like I said, we have had some com more confirmed sightings in Kahului, uh, between Kahului Harbor and the airport. And we even had one this morning closer to Waihe'e, so farther out to the northwest of this red circle you see in the photo. Um, no birds have been captured at this point. Um, again, like that predictability aspect is not, not necessarily there yet with these birds. It's more of a, we get a call and we, get, we try to get there as quickly as we can. Um, often the birds are gone. Um, so, Trying to understand a little bit more about their habits um, will definitely be helpful going forward. And again, um, we've been lucky that we've had great coverage um, in the media to help uh, influence reporting. Um, that every time we have participation by the media, uh, we get more participation by the public, more reports. Um, so we're really happy with that. So here's a timeline. Um, you know, we've we've had. The first few sightings that were in Kahului, um, we've had a few additional sightings, um, like I said, and we had one this morning in Waihe'e. Um, and the fact that they're in that Kahului area, it helps a little bit with understanding where they might be, but that's still a pretty big area. Um, you know, it's not like we know individual orchards or trees or where they might be visiting yet. So that's one of the things that we're trying to um, narrow, narrow our, our focus on. So next step with these with these birds is again just continue fielding reports. Um, Try to shorten our response time because, like I said, we we don't necessarily have a predictability. We need to be able to get there quickly. Um, try to investigate any passive options like traps, um, and then again the predictable pre predictability and, and patterns. To try to inform how we do our survey and control efforts. Okay, the last on our list is the Vernon Anthura polyanthes, which is a tree aster commonly known as Asapeche. And that name is Portuguese and means fish roaster due to the resemblance of, I guess, fish bones after the leaves are fried in uh, culinary arrangements. Um, so this plant typically grows in the three to six meter range. It's kind of a shrubby plant, but can grow to a small tree. Um, and it can spread to areas above a thousand meters. So it's very capable of thriving in tropical, 
tropical locations um, at a variety of temperatures and elevations. One, the defining feature of this plant is its uh, aster or star-like flowers that are common to the Asteraceae family of plants, which include um, things like sunflowers and dandelions. And the flowers are white and pink, um, you can see in this photo, and they produce these thin wispy seeds, much like dandelions do. You, know, you see child that blow a, blow a dandelion and all the seeds all go out everywhere. Um, this has been the case in, uh, you know, or when you have seeds like that, they can spread far and wide, right? They can blow in the wind, um, taken miles away. And this has definitely been the case uh, in other parts of the world, mainly Africa, where this plant was introduced in the 1990s, I think, um, to Mozambique. Um, it's since become a major invasive species there, spreading to um, neighboring Zimbabwe. Um, and I guess it's a significant fire hazard over there. So here on Maui, we're definitely concerned about the potential for this plant to invade uh, native leeward forest areas as well as ranch lands. Um, and then the, the fire hazard is definitely uh, also of concern. And one of the interesting things too is um, apparently in this, this plant, um, it has the seeds and they have a lot of surface area, right? And it's native range. Um, I guess the seeds can um, host fungi that could negatively affect agricultural crops. And so that's definitely a concern as well as um, if there's some sort of fungal pathogen that could be spread through this plant to others. So how did we understand, or how did we first find this plant? Um, luckily, um, retired state forester, Dr. Bob Hobdy and uh, was driving his car down Kokomo Road in Haiku in May um, of last year. And he noticed this different tree growing on the side of the road and took this photo um, and uh, yeah, it, it, luckily he saw something that looked out of place. Um, and so from there, our early detection specialist, Forrest and Kim Starr, um, they cast a wide net around that whole area to try to figure out if it's you know just this one tree or you know, is this spread far and wide. Uh, unfortunately, um, it was pretty clear that this plant was not limited to, you know, one roadside area, um, it was spread pretty far across uh, Haiku. You can see this map here kind of shows. And here's just a different viewpoint of the map just in relation to Maui with the extents. Um, and so one of the big questions, um, you know, in addition to how widespread it was, was how long had this plant been on Maui? Um, so we had to go back in time. Unfortunately, we didn't have the DeLorean time machine, but uh, Forrest and Kim used the next best thing by looking at aerial pictometry records that covered uh, the areas where they had found this plant in their surveys. And uh, they were able to look back to 2008. And then as you can see, as we go forward here, these little poof balls in the middle of this fallow field start to really grow out and expand. Um, and so this is just an example of what this plant is doing. Um, here in 2019 and it's still expanding. And as of now, we still don't know the full extent of the spread yet, but it could be affecting as much as a thousand acres at this point. And we, again, we were fortunate to have coverage of this new plant in the Kiai Moku section of the Maui News um, with one of the main take-home points um, that I wanna leave everyone today um, here with is if you see something, out of place, then report it. Um, it's kind of like the TSA at the airport. If you see something, say something. That's what Bob did. And, um, you know, we were lucky to be able to at least understand what this uh, new plant is and what it's doing um, in the landscape here. So with this one, next steps, um, you know, I, I probably should have put that first, but there the, the, the bottom um, says, you know, further analysis to inform whether eradication is feasible or not, as well as the costs involved with containment management. We don't have much experience with this plant yet. Um, we, you know, like I said, we know a little bit about what it's done in other parts of the world, but um, there's still a lot of questions here on Maui. Um, so we need to figure out what, what we can do and what we're gonna do going forward. But um, one of the challenges with this plant is that it's, it's very difficult to differentiate between other plants um, when it's not in flower. You know, it's got these, these white flowers that are, are very visible um, when it is flower, but it's hard to tell the difference between other trees, shrubs when uh, it's not. So we wanna do some drone flights um, to get some better imagery uh, this spring once the flowers are uh, 
bright and clear so we can get a better updated look at the infestation as a whole. Um, and if warranted, then we want to do try to do a ground survey that could include some suppression as well, try to cut these trees, figure out um, maybe where the seed bank is going to be. Um, and then obviously trying to do outreach during the flowering season when people can see these plants and report them is going to be ideal um, so we can increase our detection probability and subsequent reporting. Um, so one of the big questions that you know you may be asking yourself is well what can I do um, if I see one of these invasive species or any other thing that seems out of place like a snake or something like that. Well. Here's my plug for 643 pests. Um, I, I can't stress how great this um, resource is. It's a standardized resource. Um, it, it's great in that there's multiple agencies involved. And so um, when a report comes in, it can get you know um, passed out to a bunch of different folks um, across the spectrum um, you know, who need to know about it. Um, and I would just say that taking photos is like one of the best things that you can do take photos of it then report it you know um, um, and this site has a great user friendly interface with you know options to upload files and um, the whole nine yards so i encourage you to visit this site get familiar with it um, maybe uh, add it to your home icon or home screen or whatever on your phone um, it's really easy to remember 643pest.org The invasive species committees are always here to help. This is our job. This is our expertise. This is what we do. Um, we're reachable through our websites, through our social media pages. Um, we've had a lot of interaction with the community through, um, you know, email, website, social media, and um, so we love to hear from folks and, and interact. So, what if you see something really out of the ordinary? You can still call us. We're standing by to respond and have specialized training and expertise when it comes to working around some of these um, these things like snakes in particular or other, other exotic species. We actually go do specialized training to handle things when they come in. Um, so yeah, don't, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, but in some instances, you may be best off calling the police due to safety concerns and that's okay um, and much appreciated. I know in Maui County, the police department does have a contact list for um, MISC specialists when things like this come up. So that's that's OK. You know, do what you think is best. But like I said, we're always here to help. So as far as the rapid response presentation today goes, I think that's just about it. And um, I wanted to just quickly thank um, everyone. Their insignias are all here. I don't have to go down the list, but um, this is all of these uh, species have um, had a variety of input and participation from um, a huge range of agencies and people. And I, I just can't thank them enough for um, their assistance and um, leadership in this. Um, also wanna thank our funders who make this work possible, Maui County um, and the um, State of Hawaii, uh, Hawaii Invasive Species Council. And then again, just a plug and special thanks to 643 Pest for making reporting easy uh, and a, a streamlined process as most of these reports um, for these rapid responses have come from that resource. So if anybody has any questions, um, I guess I'll take them now. Yeah, let's stop share. Awesome, mahalo Adam for that great presentation and for um, letting everyone know where to call, who to call. I think sometimes we get complacent. I mean, we just walk by the same tree every day and not realize maybe that doesn't belong here. So 643 Pest definitely is a great resource. Um, I think just emphasizing early detection and rapid response for context in looking at how our native species arrived here, um, we would have maybe one or two species every two to 5,000 years that would become established here in Hawaii on its own without the aid of humans. Um, now we're seeing, you know, every one, like one plant, animal, pathogen, insect, one species arriving every three days now. And so I think your presentation really just highlights the importance of everybody being vigilant and, you know, don't be ashamed. You see something that looks kind of different or hear something that sounds kind of different or not sure what's stinging you or biting you, call 643 pests. Um, if anything, it would be a great opportunity to learn about something that may already be here or 
let folks like you know um, when to sound the alarm and go out and check it. So mahalo for that. Uh, we have a little bit of time for questions. If you have any questions and want to put it in the chat or the Q&A box, this is a great opportunity to, to ask Adam live, as well as folks on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, you can put questions live in the comment box. Um, Adam is a wealth of resource, and he is the boots on the ground rapid responder when these calls come out. Any questions? Oh. But that's you bet. <laughs> um, I have a question. How you know you you have background working with brown tree snakes, um, <laughs> and I think Adam is actually leading to the question I was going to ask. So let's just ask his. Um, so Adam Radford is asking, what's the most challenging and craziest response you've had to conduct? He read my mind. That's a great question. Um... Ooh, how to answer that? Um, well, maybe I'll list a few examples. So, I will say that Misk, like I said, please call us. You know, if if something comes up, um, even if it seems out of the ordinary, we've had reports of black panthers. Um, we've had reports of komodo dragons, spitting cobras, all sorts of things like that. That you know, we we respond to. Um, doesn't necessarily mean they're there, but we we field these reports, and so those can get pretty exciting, you know, when you've got a Bengal tiger or something like that that comes in. But as far as the most challenging um, or interesting, um, craziest responses I've done, probably be in the um, Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands. Um, so this would be Saipan, Rota, those areas, um, just north of Guam, and when um, the, the issue being that it's so close to Guam. Um, and for those who don't know, Guam has uh, has been inundated with brown tree snakes um, that have completely changed the uh, the ecological um, space on, on Guam. Um, and so we're trying to keep those snakes from getting to other islands. And when they do, um, we go as a team to uh, respond to the snake sightings, either to capture any snake or try to figure out if a snake that was seen as part of a new blossoming population. Um, and so trying to get gear together and people and get up to a whole different island um, can be challenging and, and quite wild, um, but uh, very exciting work. And um, we were able to successfully uh, recover a brown tree snake on Rhoda in 2014. That was pretty cool, um, you know, given that Rhoda is a um, hotspot for endemic wildlife, including fruit bats and, um, you know, very, um, unique species that are really only are found in the Northern Marianas Islands, different types of birds and things. So, so it was pretty rewarding, pretty challenging and um, exciting for sure. Awesome. I know it personally makes me feel better to know somebody like you with the experience and expertise to get snakes is here on Maui because we definitely don't want snakes. And I think I could speak for everybody else on, on the other islands as well. So that's really yeah. awesome. Yeah. And I, I think I mentioned in the program that we, um, like I said, we do have, you know, uh, we have, it's not just me being, you know, I, I was the former coordinator of that program. So I have, uh, you know, a lot of experience and expertise with brown tree snakes, but we do have other staff um, at multiple agencies on Maui who have gone to Guam to do the training. And so, um, like I said, we do have in-house or we have expertise on the island for these exotic things that might come in um you know like we, we do have uh we know how to handle stuff like that and um there was a cool uh story in palau um i had done training for folks there on snake response and um you know just showing the value of uh, being vigilant as they had a bamboo pit viper which is a um a really pretty green snake um but it came off of a China Airlines flight and uh, it landed in Palau and the baggage handlers who had been trained um, were able to get to it really quickly, you know, and, and basically dispatch it based on the training that they had had. And so it just highlights the, the, the need to stay vigilant and also, um, you know, utilize the, the skills of, of all the, the agencies and the, the personnel that are involved.
Absolutely. And kind of so on the subject of snakes, I'm just curious, maybe um, since you've been doing this annually, how many snake reports, um, and this can just be a guesstimation, but how many snake reports do you think you receive and have you actually ever found snakes? Good question. Yeah, we, we don't actually receive that many. Um, in the past few years, we um, that one I think I mentioned where there was a, uh, a the wildfire out in Lahaina had burned through a section where there was a bunch of PVC pipe and this PVC pipe was melted and draped over a tree and that was reported as a snake and when I looked at the photo I was like oh wow that, that does look I could see how it would um, throw somebody off but um, we had we had that one that came in um, we did have an actual snake coming to Maui um, that was found in Kahului it came in on a, a shipment of, um, I think, household goods in a, in a shipping container, and um, it was a corn snake, so just a little snake. It was only about that big, um, but that was reported by uh, a local family um, who was actually running a restaurant in the area. Um, they had seen the snake, and somebody, I guess, had accidentally backed over it, and so the snake was dead. Um, but fortunately, it hadn't gotten across the street to the Kanaha Wildlife uh, reserve over there, but, um, we did have a snake incursion there. Um, so fortunately it resolved itself, but I did spend, uh, quite a few nights combing that area just to make sure it wasn't indicative of a, a population of snakes. Um, cause that's always the concern when you see one, there might be, there might be many, right? Yeah, absolutely. Thank goodness they ran it over and there was not a population. So thanks for responding to that. Um, Bill Pereira is asking, are snake reports for the entire state available to the public? So maybe um, if you, I, are you interested in just knowing if snakes have arrived here, Bill, or more so how to report them? But maybe you can answer both. Yeah, I'm actually not aware of a, like a, a publicly um, shared database of all the snakes that have arrived. Um, I think that information is probably cast out among different agencies who've been involved in the response, meaning like the Department of Agriculture or the invasive species committees. Um, so I don't know if there's one clearinghouse to look at all that stuff. I know the military has been involved in a lot of responses too with snakes. And um, so there's a lot you can find online looking at the history, specifically with brown tree snakes, since there's so much um, transport and uh, you know permanent change of station type stuff between Guam and, and Oahu in particular, uh, where they do have, you know, snakes that arrive in like a box or in a wheel well of a plane and they have to do a, um, a response to or, um, uh, but I will say that the interdiction efforts that go on in Guam and uh, in Hawaii are quite strong. Um, in Guam, they have um, their own whole program, uh, at USDA, where they're doing um, inspections of cargo and aircraft. See, you know, all the Navy ships whole nine yards, they're going out with night vision goggles in the middle of the night with, you know, um, Jack Russell Terriers that are trained to sniff for snakes, the whole nine yards. And um, the fact that we don't have more snakes, um, specifically brown tree snakes coming into Hawaii, um, knowing that there's so many on, on uh, Guam is, I think, a testament to how great that interdiction program is um, so far. I mean, the, the odd one gets out here and there, squeaks through, but for the most part, it's um, we're able to wrap it up pretty quick. Yeah, that's really comforting to know. And maybe that could be a potential um, high Sam presentation for next year, getting in touch with some of those folks to hear about what they're doing. Sounds like a, a cool operation. Um, Adam is saying um, there's also a snake proof fence around the airport on, on Guam as well. So that may help keep them out. Yeah, just for context, um, the airports and seaports are kind of, you know, I guess for lack of a better term, under assault by the snakes where, um, the USDA, they have traps. These are traps that uh, have live mice in them um, that are luring the snakes in um, to try to keep them from going through into the airport or the seaport um, to getting you know, on a ship or on a plane. They're pulling, I think like 10,000 snakes out of these traps off these fence lines per year. Um, so yeah, it's, it's like I said, it's quite effective. Uh, they do a great job over there. Keep us, keep our, uh, our ecosystems and our way of life here in Hawaii protected so it doesn't come. As we hear a plane fly over you right now, that was good timing. I don't know how you set that up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yep, no snakes on planes. 
please. Um, all right, if anyone, oh, Bill, we got a question from Bill. Do you think that a brown tree snake could survive falling out of an airplane wheel well on approach to the runway? And maybe a snake fence on Oahu? Do, what, do I think a uh, snake could survive falling out of an airplane well? I, I mean, I hate to say it's impossible. Anything is possible, right? But um, I think one of the things is those planes fly so high. Um, typically, the survival rate of a snake uh, or the, the survival of a snake would be dependent on it being able to stay warm enough, not freeze. Um, so I think that's usually the case with like hydraulic lines or electronics or whatever they're in the wheel wells that can kind of get close and survive. I think the chances... Um, could be real. I mean, it's possible for sure, um, but hopefully it's relatively low. Um, but again, that the interdiction starts at the um, at the source, right? So in Guam, like I said, they have um, people and animals that go sniff and look for snakes that would be in a wheel well. Um, they do inspections. Um, this is every single aircraft um, that departs there at nighttime, in particular, um, both the military and um, general aviation, commercial aviation. Um, so yeah, anything's possible, right? <laughs> Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I have one more question for you that we can start wrapping up. So, you know, given your lengthy experience doing a lot of early detection and response, your brown tree snake um, experience as well, is there any plant, animal, or pathogen that you haven't talked about today that kind of keeps you up at night that you think about that maybe hasn't arrived here, um, but has a potential to, and that has you particularly worried about and maybe something that um, the public can know to, to keep an eye out for? That's a great question. Um, I mean, talking about brown tree snakes, so that's obviously a, that's a big one. Um, I do think the fire ant situation here, like if we got red important fire ant, It'd be kind of a game changer. We already have, you know, limited uh, infestations of the little fire ant. Um, and I don't know if for those of you who've been stung or it's, it's quite, uh, it can be quite, <laughs> quite irritating, um, can change the game for sure. Um, change the quality of life, really devastating impacts for the ecosystems. Um, so I think, yeah, red imported fire ant could, I mean, that could really eclipse uh, little fire ant, so it definitely keeps me up at night. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's a host of, host of other nasties. You know, I used to think that about rose ring parakeet after I saw the videos from um, Kauai, and so now it's it's here. Um, they were definitely motivated to try to get those before it becomes a real huge problem. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a good question. I think if I had to put a number on it, I'd say red and border fire ant. Great. Yeah. So let's be out on the lookout, make sure those don't get here. And if you think you see it, contact MISC or 643 PEST. And we actually have um, some information about the Red Imported Fire Ant in our presentation earlier this week with Marley. Um, um, and her presentation is called As the Blog Grows. So if you want to go back to the link that Beth dropped into the chat, you can watch that presentation and learn a little more about Red Imported Fire Ant. A um, couple more minutes to ask any questions, but let's just start wrapping up a little bit. Um, we've just completed our second week. I think this is our second week, right, Beth? Of Hi, Sam. Uh, Third presentations. Week. Third week. Okay, see, <laughs> just time is flying when you're having fun. Um, so this is the conclusion of our Balkanaka being in our realm of human um, interaction. Um, areas and invasive species. Uh, we're going to go into um, Kahakai, so hele on down to the coastline next week. Uh, we do have one more presentation though tonight at seven o'clock with the Native Hawaiian Plant Society. So it's going to be a really awesome talk to hear about uh, what they're doing and some, some great talks about native plants. Uh, next week, as we go into our Kahakai realm, we're going to have a presentation on Tuesday, the 22nd at 9 a.m. And it's an aquatic invasive species prevention and management on Oahu with Depart uh, Division of Aquatic Resource Biologist Lizzie Monahan. Um, that same day, we also have a presentation on invasive limu chondria tumulosa. 
um, that's going to be at 10 o'clock. And then that evening, we'll have Turning Off the Tap, Working in Partnership to Address Cat Overpopulation in Hawaii with a really great panel talking about invasive um, cats. And that will be at six o'clock. So we're going to jump off of this holiday weekend to some really great presentations on Tuesday. So we hope you can join us. Um, the, the link to go to that um, page that has the schedule of events, um, as well as where to sign up to join the webinars and see past webinars from this past month are in the chat from Beth. Um, and this presentation will also be live on our Facebook um, and posted right after this, as well as on the website as well. So uh, with that, mahalo everybody for joining us today. Mahalo Adam for your great presentation and we hope to see you soon. Aloha. Thanks for having me.